Hello everyone and welcome to Columbus Metropolitan Club. I'm Carol Newcomb-Aluto and I'm chair of CMC's Board of Trustees. It's great to see everyone today, particularly given the weather out there. It looks like fall and winter are definitely on their way. Next week on Wednesday, November 8th, CMC is excited to host the husband and wife team of Lonnie and Ellen Mosley Thompson, world-renowned climate experts in a conversation with COSI President and CEO Frederick, Frederick Bertley. This forum is sponsored by WCBE 90.5. Speaking of sponsorships, you will notice in your forum flyer a recognition of the more than 80 companies that support the Columbus Metro Metropolitan Club as sponsors. Starting with as little as a thousand dollar sponsorship provides great benefits with customized packages that include corporate memberships. Let us know you're interested and we'll get started immediately. We would be happy to work with you. Of course, we have many great conversations and forums in the pipeline, so please stay tuned and reserve, reserve all your Wednesdays for CMC. And of course, you can visit Columbus Metro Club org for further details. Today's forum, The Future of Art, was de developed in collaboration with CBUS Next Series of the Columbus Dispatch and is sponsored by Puffin Foundation West and Dispatch Media Group, each represented here by many friends and associates. Would you please help me thank them for this sponsorship? <laughs> We look to the arts as impetus for change, catalyst for development, and critical contributions to our quality of life. Cities and towns around the nation have recognized that the arts can change everything. Arts also connect our communities and support our democracy. Let's turn to our panelists to learn more. So please welcome Executive Director of the Short North Alliance, Betsy Pandora. Artist and Associate Professor at the Columbus College of Art and Design, Matthew Moore. <laughs> Senior Project Coordinator of the Columbus Art Commission, Lori Bardro. <laughs> and today, our host and founder of Story Forge and former president of the board of the Ohio Arts League, Haley Boning. <laughs> Haley, it's yours. Great. Well, as Carol said, we are here today to talk about the future of art, uh, more specifically public art. And why are we talking about art in this room with all these people? Because we know Columbus makes art and art makes Columbus. <laughs> Clearly we are represented by GCAC in the room today. <laughs> Just send the check to my office. Uh, so we have an amazing panel here. I thought we would start with what's happening right now in our city um, and hear a little bit about some of the public art projects that are happening. So I'd love to start with Betsy uh, and to talk a little bit about what's happening in the short north, then maybe hear specifically uh, one of the uh, exciting public arts projects that's just gone in place, and then hear a little bit from Lori uh, about the larger city uh, scape right now when it comes to public art. So Betsy, would you mind kicking us off by talking about what's happening in the short north? Well, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I'll first say that they were worried today that everybody would be so excited to talk about art that they had to feed you a turkey dinner uh, with the tryptophan to make sure that we calm the audience down. So um, stay with us, stay awake, it was delicious. Um, uh, so there's been a lot going on uh, in the Short North Arts District with respect to public art. Um, and our neighborhood, I think, has had a really beautiful and, and long-standing history within our city as being a place where um, the arts are celebrated um, in, in a variety of ways. Uh, as far as public art is concerned, uh, you, you know, I think some of the first things that we started to see in the neighborhood 30 plus years ago um, were really used as kind of catalyzers to help um, uh, bring people together and fill blank spaces. Um, with some of the, the murals uh, painted on buildings that have become pretty iconic to the neighborhood and have a lot of, I think, um, connection uh, for people to our community. Um, uh, maybe 15-ish years ago, there was an effort to um, do some sculptural works in some pocket parks around the neighborhood. 
Um, and between those two sets of assets, that's kind of made up um, the, the base of the, the public art pieces that we have in the district. Um, about five years ago, we um, as an organization, the Short North Alliance, um, really, really in deep partnership with um, the gallery community in the Short North Arts District began to develop a series of public artworks um, that were temporary. And uh, the idea behind that, which is our Short North Temporary Mural Series, is to allow artists who may not work in the public art media um, to have an opportunity to really be celebrated in a large way in public space and to more deeply connect people to those artists in our community. Um, you may experience a work one way in an art gallery, but you experience it very differently when it is big on the side of a building. Uh, and with historic preservation being such um, a strong value of the neighborhood um, uh, and preserving sort of the historic facades of buildings, um, you know, there, there aren't too many additional spaces where you could see new painted murals. So that has a series, has become so popular. Um, we change it annually. Um, the way that we watch people engage with that series is, is really remarkable because it, it draws them into a given artwork that's very site specific, but they, they photograph themselves and they, they kind of transform the experience of the art too through the way that they share the images of it. Um, and what we've also started to do is uh, really push towards a stronger emphasis on permanent artworks in the district as well. Um, uh, there's a, a major effort taking place now and over the next uh, two years um, to uh, enhance and beautify um, the streetscape environment of the short north. Um, as the neighborhood has grown and a lot more businesses have located there and a lot more things have located there, um, we, we have a built environment that isn't necessarily conducive to the, the growth and development that we're seeing in the district. So there's a real opportunity around making those public pedestrian improvements. And with that, there'll be a lot of new space um, for permanent artworks uh, where there, there frankly hasn't been before. Um, so we've, we've started to uh, examine unique opportunities around added permanent artworks in the district um, through private property partnerships and private property owners, um, but also within that, that new physical environment of High Street. And one such project that um, we, we recently completed is called the Messenger Wall, which is at Fifth and High. Uh, and is with a local artist, Eric Rausch, and his wife, Jen Kiko, um, and is a ceramic art piece um, that uh, uh, takes brick and um, almost creates a relief carving with it. Um, we have other private property owners that are now pursuing artworks. The White Castle Corporation is interested in investing in a permanent art piece in the district, and that's a project that's evolving and ongoing. Um, and then we even have the, the Donato's uh, Corporation that's investing in a Stephanie Ron piece that will be debuting uh, some point next year, too. Um, so there's, there's a lot um, that's taking place in the short north, and I think what's cool about it is it's, it's kind of all culminating with what's the, the brave new world of, of art and artwork with Matthew's oh, new wow. piece in the district. Thank you. Well, uh, oh, that's very kind. <laughs> Thanks. Clap for Matthew. Oh, well, I mean, I'm glad she went first. She's, you're good at this. I <laughs> but, I mean, you did mention that it's about connecting. It's about connecting with uh, the art community. It's about finding our sense of place <coughs> here. And art is is a, is a exquisite way to do that. It's It becomes a part of who we are. I'm very, very glad to be part of a collection of art at the convention center, over 200 pieces. Uh, they've made an incredible investment in the arts. And, um, you know, it's just amazing that I'm part of a group of artists that are you know, now contributing, but also I think about Amina Robinson and I think about Danny Griffith, and I was like, oh, it's so good to be part of that. Um, but yeah, no, uh, it's been very gratifying. People have really be, been having a good time with it. People are really um, taking the time to, to understand what it's about, and, um, you know, it's pretty cool. So for, for those of us in the room who might not have seen the piece or interacted with it, can you give us a brief description of, of what the piece is? Oh, yeah. And then uh, maybe as a follow-up question, I'm curious, because it is a piece that incorporates technology, what, oh, yeah. we, what we have learned from the piece as the way, and the way people have interacted with it. Well, I appreciate you, you bringing up the technology about it. I think it is packed to the gills with technology. It's, um, it's a first in, in many ways. 
um, and it's the first of its kind as a sculpture. Um, but it's really about communicating with the technology, and and it's about um, social media and our relationship it calls into question how we're evolving with it. And uh, you know, as well, it should be fun. I think people are having a lot of fun with it. Um, so if you haven't seen it, it's a 14-foot, three-dimensional LED wrapped head uh, where. You walk around and into the back of the neck, there's this photo booth with 29 cameras. You sit down, you have a simultaneous picture made of your head, and uh, when you step out, uh, about a minute later, your head is displayed on this 14-foot head. So It uh, could make a Kardashian weep. Me. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. So um, it's an intense experience. I remember the first time I saw it. Um, with the full-size prototype, I was, I, I had a theory about how people would interact with it. I thought, you know, people would have fun with it, but I was really taken aback. I was like, wow, that is how people see me. Uh, that's, you know, it was a little, t a little shocking maybe. And then after maybe 10 seconds, I was like, well, that's kind of how I move through the world. And, and I think I got, I sort of came at peace with it. And I think other people are having the same reaction, but I think there are probably people having as many reactions as there are people willing to uh, to subject themselves. And it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to have their portrait made 14 feet tall. And I'm, I'm yeah. sure there are a lot of traditional visual artists out there who would love to have the kind of numbers and measurement that your piece yeah, gives you. Yeah, there's a few. So tell us, how, how many people have interacted with, with the piece and how long has it been on display? It's been a couple months and we already have over 3,000 portraits on there. So clearly people are, are willing to, to have their portrait made. And, uh, and even the people that aren't having their pictures made, they'll stand and watch it for, for minutes and, and just sort of take it in. It's, you know, it's portraiture. It's thousands of years of portraiture where I'm doing the same thing, only it's involving technology. So. Well, you, you have whet our appetite oh. in the city for public art and what amazing public art can do. So, I, I, Lori, I'd really love to hear, not to put you on the spot, but um, with this uh, incredible example that Matthew's given us of what public art can do, both for residents and for visitors, I, I'm curious to hear, wh what are you thinking is next for the city? Wh where is the city's head, no pun intended, um, <laughs> when we talk about public art? Um, well, from, <laughs> from the government, and uh, they're I'm, here to help. I'm, I'm here to help with <laughs> public art. <laughs> It's been a long time coming, and um, actually, you know, just following up the Short North and Matthew's piece, um, just with the convention centers done, I mean, there's just a dynamism that's, that's happening along that corridor that's just undeniable, and it's very exciting. Um, just to give you a little bit of background before I jump forward, um, you know, we've been trying off and on to get a public art program, a percent for art program established in the city, and hadn't been very successful with that. Um, but under the previous administration, uh, Mayor Coleman decided to, to seat an art commission, which was on the city's books since, I don't know, 1960 or so. They just hadn't been seated. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's a seven-member commission, um, and we have great people that have been serving on it and some new people who have recently come on to the commission. And their role is very specific. It's designed by code, Chapter 3115. And um, just I was, the conversation that you all had last week here, um, any art that's acquired by the city, by any form, gift, purchase, however, has to be approved by the Art Commission for design and placement. Likewise, if you want to decommission an artwork, it has to go to the Art Commission for that as well. Their authority also extends over into the public right-of-way. You would be surprised at how excited public service can become when they realize that they are relieved from having any role in the aesthetic of art that might go into the public right away that they just have to look at it in terms of you know engineering and safety and something like that so we had a lot of support from that department for for the art commission um, coming on board um, when the city's bicentennial came around in 2012 the commission really wanted to try and step out and the code was adopted or um, adapted to include advocacy and so we asked the administration could we get some money to do a um, bicentennial themed, uh, more inspired public art piece, and that was agreed to. And then in 2013, um, Lawrence Argent's piece, Flowing Kiss, was dedicated over at North Bank Park. 
Um, sadly, Mr. Argent's passed away since then, so we're, we're really happy that we have a piece of his art in, in our collection. Um, then in 2014, um, a public art program actually was established here in the Columbus by an executive order. So I guess the, the main takeaway with that is there's a lot of ways to do this. It doesn't have to be a percent for our program and a lot of different um, cities have done things in different ways that, that work for them and how their government um, operates. So, um, you know, we moved through and in 2015, the first site of lounge pieces came in, the deer behind uh, uh, Kosai at Genoa Park by artist Terry Allen. And then the third piece, which I think has gotten a lot of attention just because of its location over on the Rich Street Bridge is Saito Bridge or Saito Lo Saito Lounge on the bridge. And um, if you stop and look at them, as many people have, they're incredibly detailed pieces. And also, if you look at them, pay attention to where they seem worn. Um, a lot of people like to um, pat the deer on its bottom as they go by <laughs> on the bridge. Uh, there's a lot of yeah, and there's a lot of little places on the horns of uh, the buck sitting behind Kosai, its knees from where people are sitting on him. Um, kids, uh, I would have to say one of the things that we're always looking at with these pieces and have to try and figure out with recreation and parks um, is something that we can do to find a grass that can stand up to the amount of love and attention that these pieces get because the um, I don't think it's any secret if you go out there, but at the end of every summer, um, the, uh, the, the metal pieces that go into the cement that anchor the artwork down, they're a little bit exposed just because people are out there and tramping around these works and, and that's what the artist wanted. So it's a, it's a good problem, but it is something we have to take a, take a look at. Um, we've had other projects starting uh, in neighborhoods, a piece over at Livingston Park, partnerships, we're always looking to do partnerships. So I guess if we're looking at the direction of public art stepping forward, we have some other art pieces that are underway. Um, we're, right now it's a single staff program and we do receive generally some annual funding from, um, from the administration, but what we'd like to do is get out into the neighborhoods more. Um, we did that a little bit with the Public Art Bike Rack Program, um, which has been really well received. And in fact, you know, we have a couple pieces there that were really loved, and we took a chance with them, and, and we're going to be replacing those. They're very exuberant pieces. Um, and so they had some pieces that sort of went out that sometimes adults decided to do chin-ups on. Um, so, you know, it's, it, we're in a learning phase. Um, to, we don't want to say no to everything. We're willing to try things and see how it goes, learn, learn from what's happening and talk with other people in other cities about, about what they're doing. But I think that the, the, the major thrust for public art in the city of Columbus is to start moving out at the neighborhood level. And at some point, um, I'm a planner um, by background, so you won't be surprised for me to say this, we'd like to get a public art master plan. And the, the, the purpose of the master plan, um, we're a really large city geographically, and we have a lot of neighborhoods. And it's really important to the city that um, we give opportunities for people to experience public art where they are. And the only way that we can do that is really by coming up with a strategy for taking it out farther to neighborhoods and looking for more partnerships to help make that happen. Um, we also have really become aware that over the years we haven't always treated our memorials and art that we have right now in our um, parks and um, around City Hall particularly well. So I'm really proud that the commission really focused on shoring that up, re, um, restoring artwork that's already in the city's collection. And um, I'm happy to say that we will be doing um, a project in 2018 and at that point I think that we will be pretty caught up with regard to restoration of artwork that we already have in our collection and then really moving over to a plan of, of maintenance for the for public artworks. That's great. And Laura, you mentioned learning, that we're in this planning phase and we're learning. I think that's something that Columbus does very well. We love to be a fast second, right? We love to go out there and learn and let other people try things and learn from what they've done. So I'm curious to hear from, from all of you, where are you finding your inspiration right now? 
when you're thinking about public art. If you're looking to other cities, I know we're, we're slowly getting up the list of largest cities in, uh, in the country, and as we get a little bit higher, we begin to get more aspirational, I think, in who we're looking to for an example. So I'd love to hear, in your three experiences, you know, wh where do you find inspiration? What do you think we can learn from? Okay, can go do it. Yeah, you sure? Yeah. Get in there, Pretty Matthew. Well, I, yeah, Matthew, you know, where are you? There's a sparkle in your eye. <laughs> you, uh, you know, I, I think I think we're, you know, I think I find inspiration in the in the materials that I've been given to work with. I think I find inspiration through the community that I'm working within, and I think that I start with a question: um, How can we engage? How can we? Uh, uh, get people involved, how can I get your attention, how can I get you to think about an experience and um, see the community in a new way. And, and you know, I think everybody's, every artist is, has their own process. Uh, so I can't really predict that, but I can say that um, through technology, Let's look at it this way. We're b bombarded with imagery on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And with interactive art, you have a chance to garner somebody's attention for an extended period of time, and which is a luxury these days. And I would love to see um, more art be interactive to the degree that it uh, really communicates something. The best public art to my mind is acts on multiple levels at a very visceral base level everybody should have fun with it everybody should have some relationship with it um, but on another level or another plane they should have something more to to grasp or to to meditate on or to draw from and uh, I've, I have seen some really great stuff happening around Ohio you know um, uh, Malcolm Cochran's work or Todd Slaughter's work um, I think about the field of corn that, you know, it on a very visceral level makes sense. Um, it's corn. Um, but, <laughs> and you, you, you had the same reaction to when I saw it the first time too, right? Um, but it really does celebrate the heritage of the land, you know, and the people that lived here before us. It's something to really ponder and think about. And I think that's an excellent example, right? Um, it's something worth thinking about. So. That's my take. How's that? How did I do? You did fabulous. Oh, thanks. Thank you. you know, I think as far as uh, work in the short north is concerned, um, you know, the, the point that you made, Matthew, about engagement, I think is just so spot on. And, you know, I think, I think personally as we've, as an organization, approached public artworks, you know, artists are in many ways these instruments that allow us to experience sort of the souls of humanity in all of these different ways. They um, allow us to more deeply engage with each other. And I think in our community, the, the way that we're thinking big about art and the future of our community is how that community really does get more and increased opportunities for that creative, inclusive engagement. Um, there's a planning process underway right now um, with the um, city of Columbus and they're leading that and uh, with an investment that the city will make with the streetscape work that's taking place. And what we are hearing from people is what inspires them, the level of engagement that they want to have is big and bold. It's um, more of these beautiful um, uh, works like Matthew's doing that truly bring people together in a, in a, in a very community-focused way. So um, I say that because I think it's, it's a very Columbus way to be. It is kind of Columbus's time to take and um, embrace and own um, uh, really making big and strategic investments in public art. Um, we've, we've, as a community and a city, grown so vibrantly that this is, I think, as you've said, Haley, the next great inevitability. So I, you know, I think big, bold, inspirational um, ideas is what gives us vision, and whether that's places in this city, artists in this city, or other, other successes in other communities that have done that and done that well, I think that's what gives us inspiration. That's great. I'm, I'm curious if I could prompt something with you, Lori. So you mentioned uh, Columbus and who we are and the things that make us who we are. Matthew, you mentioned that sense of 
sense of place coming into your artwork. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, the, the, the drumbeat that we hear of public-private partnership, public-private partnership. I'm curious as to if that's, if that's making its way into your thinking or the city's thinking, Lori, about the future of public art. I think that that's always part of the city's thinking. I mean, it extends how do you, it's sort of a big tent approach. And we, again, have such a large, woo, large city that um, I think it behooves us to, to look at as many partners as possible, GCAC, um, you know, the Short North Alliance with the um, uh, Art on High project that we're doing right now. Um, I guess, you know, working for city government and using city funds, you have to be mindful and you have to be respectful of that. You can't ever divorce that. And so, you know, you, you always have to kind of balance that with the desire for a robust program and um, uh, working with artists and not having to say no all the time but really allowing exploration and innovation in the type of work that they do. And it really is kind of a balance of um, how you go about your business. I was reading something written by Janet Zweig. She participated in Public Art 2012, the um, Columbus piece that was on the side of the building down on Broad Street. And um, that was something that was spearheaded by one of our commissioners, already been mentioned, Malcolm Cochran. And, you know, he was really looking to find ways of bringing more contemporary art into Columbus to help people maybe understand and see it a little bit more and maybe be more open to it happening um, in the city. And I think he was largely successful at that. But one of the things that Janet um, has said is that, you know, there is a difference between designers and artists. And, you know, designers tend to be problem solvers. They're, they're, they're looking at function, they're looking at deadline, and they're dealing with their clients' budgets. Um, and artists are a bit different from that, not that they're divorced from budget or time constraints, but, you know, <laughs> no, nothing no, personal with that. We made sure that um, it was obvious that Matthew was the artist today. Lori and I did the tartan look, and uh, Matthew yeah. did his, uh, floral, his lovely floral, floral yeah. tie, just so you know. Um, but artists, you know, they redefine the problem. They look at things more broadly. You know, we may be thinking one thing and they come in with something entirely different. So, you know, you have to be, you have to be open to that and allowing some of that rede redefinition and search of um, how, you know, what they bring to the table. It's very specific and trusting of them um, and the, the direction that they're going. And having said that, um, you know, City of Columbus, um, when we do artist calls, we put together information, we talk to communities. We have to, and that's, you know, one of the inspirational things for me is, is talking to folks in the community, understanding a little bit um, about them. And, you know, I've been at the city for a long time. I know a lot of neighborhoods, it's, you know, maybe at this point very um, broad and very specific in some areas and frankly a little sub superficial in other ones. So you have to really kind of go in with fresh eyes and, um, and talk, to, talk to folks where you're looking at doing a public art project. Um, but then uh, you also, you know, the other inspiration is working with artists. I mean, it's a really um, interesting, engaging, sometimes challenging, but in a very good way um, of doing things. It kind of reorders your way of thinking about things. Um, you know, uh, is a piece going to be historic? Is it going to be something that will be fun or whimsical? Is it something that's going to cause us to pause and have some serious thought? Um, you know, there's just a lot of different ways that things can get done. And for me, the inspiration is kind of following that line as it goes and seeing what, um, what the artist comes back with and, you know, what that project is and also how people engage with it uh, when it first comes, and then how it engage, how people engage with it over a period of time. Um, you know, Field of Corn, a few eyebrows raised when it first came, and now it's something that's that's marketed by the city of Dublin. People talk about it. People meet there. I mean, it's it's taken on a life of its own. And you know, we've seen that with, um, in particular, the the deer over on the Ridge Street Bridge, the pieces behind Kosai you know, Lawrence's pieces, um, people just kind of gravitate toward those um, um, items. And I, I'm also really inspired by the idea of any of us going through our day, walking around outside, um, doing our thing, whatever that is, and all of a sudden coming upon something that maybe we didn't expect. 
uh, at, at the first time and having to kind of stop and think about it and having that um, uh, sort of interrupt our day or intrude in our day a little bit and you know maybe have us thinking about something else for a little while and um, then coming to expect it. Um, we uh, public art uh, natural materials are used a lot we ended up with Lawrence's piece having to change from the stone that was out there the black and white stone to the stainless steel cladding around the support for the piece I got a lot of calls <laughs> wondering what was going on and you know so that all that was I was happy that people were concerned about it but also it just kind of told me that people were really noticing the piece so they noticed when there were changes it was it was surprising to them and so they wanted to know more about it um, so you know it's again it's it's really the community the response and and working with artists that I, I think is really inspirational Good. Yeah, sure. so let me take it back to a, a more fundamental question so for, for each of you imagine that everyone in this room is controlling the purse strings to the budget for public art and you have to get through every person in this room to get the millions and millions of dollars that you know you want to invest in public art and they're making decisions about lots of other initiatives and lots of other programs that are happening at the city that all have the outcomes that have been mentioned and the reasons why they exist mm -hmm. can you help me convince this room of people that public art is something we should be investing money in why do we do it if I may um we need to have a way to distinguish ourselves. I mean, we don't want to be another exit off of an interchange where people come through and they've been here, but they don't really remember anything about being here. We need things that, you know, when people visit the city um, that are uniquely Columbus. And, and from my perspective, a lot of times I focus mostly on the people who are living in the city and interacting with the city on a daily basis. I truly believe that if you if you do art pieces and engagement that really speaks to those folks that um, they feel positive about they're going to talk to other people about it and it's sort of an exponential growth that other folks visiting the city will learn about it and um, it will grow that way but you really have to make sure that the people um, the citizens of Columbus um, by and large feel good about what it is that you're doing because you know it really is first and foremost for folks who are who are living here and who are working here and engaging in the city in a, in a daily basis and anything that you derive beyond that um, is great and um, important also from a from an economic development and visitor perspective um, when I was first looking uh, I don't know 15 almost 20 years ago at public art programs one of the things that struck me way back then when I was looking at some um, advertisements for employees, um, university hospitals across the country, other things, I was working on some totally disassociated project. Public art was often mentioned. You know, that was one of the ways that these employers conveyed to employees that they were trying to attract to their city, that they would be coming to a vibrant, diverse environment, was talking about the arts, talking about culture talking about public art so you know I think it's it's very important I don't think that you can really um, pit it against other city services they all have their place they all have their importance but um, you know there are a lot of people in our city that aren't necessarily engaging with the wonderful cultural institutions that we have in our in our city um, so if we give them other opportunities to explore and experience art outside maybe that will also help get them inside the doors of, of these other great institutions that we have yeah I couldn't agree more I mean well said I, th I, I like well that you're getting ca calls about just s small changes to your art it, it just sort of reinforces the idea that you know this becomes part of our identity and they don't want to change they want to keep it the way it was and I'm you know I I think that uh, you know was it Winston Churchill said during World War II you know somebody asked him what they what what we were fighting for and they were fighting for our culture I think that Columbus is a you know as the word goes it's a smart and open city I think we're fighting for that and we're establishing our identity I like the fact that you have uh, you know we're building a plan for this because you know there there's obviously a lot of good stuff already here but there's to achieve parity with other cities we've got a long way to go mm -hmm. and and I think that um, you know we have a real opportunity I won't say it's a blank canvas 
But I think it's a, I think it's a wide open opportunity to really, really create the city and really express who we are. I, you know, um, Mayor Ginter was one of the first people. I don't know if it was Coleman first or, or Mayor Ginter was first. But either way, Mayor Ginter said after he was uh, after he had his photograph taken in the in the sculpture, he said, you know, this is you know you, you can see all the different faces being displayed one after the other and um, you know he said this this sculpture is really about us it's really about you know it's a very democratic um, piece that speaks to who we are and and what we want to be and I was super super happy to hear that and I want to I want to hear from Betsy but before I give it to Betsy to share her final thought I want to let you know that we are going to move to the audience for questions I know there's some great questions out there so if you have a question do not be shy you can move toward the microphone at any time uh, and after we hear from uh, from Betsy we'll we'll take uh, questions from the audience so Betsy your final thought I got, I'm closing this out you are I'm you're going to close out. strong I have confidence in you let's see um, how do you make the case to support public art? Uh, I think both of my co-panelists here did a beautiful job of stating that. You know, we live in a time where we are, around every term, disconnecting from each other, right? We're, we're living in our phones, we're, um, we're, we're not as connected as human beings as maybe um, we once were face-to-face, -face, right? Digitally we are. So I, I feel like People crave that connection, and what people also crave, I think in this city, is a, a real identity and a real pulse that continues to move the city forward. Um, you know, I'm looking at Pete McGinty, my friend over there, who, who many, many, for many years has, has thought about um, image marketing and identity, and, um, and the good team at Experience Columbus now has identified that as an issue for Columbus, is that there is a, a lack of a pulse that people perceive and perceive well. Um, I think public art has the ability to be that pulse, and um, support for the arts in general in this city, um, not just public art, but um, with public art as um, a gateway to arts experiences across the board can be very, very, very powerful and is needed. Um, so I would say uh, if, if we're going to continue to grow and evolve as a city and grow into the city um, that continues to attract and retain uh, sports teams or young professionals, we need to work awfully hard on um, how we continue to dial up that pulse and public art is one of the ways that we can do that. Great. Thank you, Betsy. So it is a Columbus Metropolitan Club tradition to take audience questions. Um, thank you for coming up to the podium. I'm going to ask all of you who have questions uh, to please state your name, ask your question, uh, and in consideration of everyone who has questions that they would like to hear answered, please stick to questions rather than editorials. Um, I know these panelists would also be very happy to stick around after today's panel um, to answer any detailed questions or have conversations about um, things that might be uh, uh, salient to one of them, <coughs> parking in a short north, or other things that you might have on your mind. Um, so with that, I turn it to our first question. Thank you. My name is Richard Hood. I need to rephrase my statement into a question. Thank you. Uh, Haley, when you asked the panelists f f uh, uh, to uh, identify a city where they had gotten inspiration, they didn't answer. But I, I would ask, and, but I thought Laurie was spot on with the, we need to not be in just another interchange off the freeway. Uh, you, ha have you, Laurie, and all of you, have you ever focused on the really big uh, home run pieces like in Chicago, the Bean, and before that, the, the Picasso, where every time you look in an airline magazine and that city is being talked about, it's the public art that's the photo, instead of in Columbus where it's Ohio Stadium, perhaps. So have you, have you ever tried to create an initiative for a really big home run, iconic art piece? Um, well, you're right. I didn't answer that question. There's so many cities that I looked at, you know, when I was wanting a public art program um, and drooling over. And then as we started uh, moving toward public art, um, 
you know, the, 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 the Seattles and um, the Portland and New York and Philadelphia and the word iconic makes me kind of nervous. Um, the words, um, you know, talking about something that is, um, um, what's the phrase, just sort of world famous or, um, I, I think to a certain degree, um, we've tried doing things in the city before and it hasn't necessarily worked because the right pieces weren't there, whether it was the funding or whether it was um, the support to fully engage in projects that, that have happened. And so I have to admit I've been a little um, hesitant to want to dive back into that without having success of sort of the, 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 pro, the smaller pieces that we've been doing. Absolutely, um, I'd love to um, look at bigger projects. Absolutely, I would love to, and I hope I'm not upsetting anyone in city government um, uh, and county, to go back and take a look at the Broad Street Bridge again, you know, when we're ready for that. Um, and finding um, these larger pieces, and, and again, it gets back to something that becomes iconic because it's loved and it's accepted and it's promoted by the people who live in the city. Maybe it is an artist of stature who comes here and does things. Um, but I guess I don't necessarily approach it in terms of I want an iconic piece of art. You know, I want a really good piece of art. I want, I want a really engaging piece of art. I want something that pushes us, you know, a little further each time. Um, and by nature of doing that, um, you know, having the support to keep moving forward and hopefully, yes, we will get to the point where we pick an artist like um, Janet Sweeg or we pick an artist, um, you know, that's out there, <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> who's doing very large budget projects. We have artists in our community who are out there doing million dollar projects. Ann Hamilton was awarded a million dollar project in Seattle and they don't even know what she's going to do yet. You know, that's amazing, right, that we can have that kind of comfort level um, to allow that sort of, that sort of art to flourish. And I'm it's sorry like if I'm not one of our, directly, It's like getting one of our players traded to another team, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Anne's ours. Yeah. This is my Instagram account. I just type in As We Are, which is the title of the sculpture. It's starting to happen. People are noticing that piece. Mm -hmm. It's part of the design that it is become, that it does become part of who we are and it says something about who we are. Uh, there's a lot more to come. Uh, we're clearly on the path. And so I, I think part of why none of us started naming cities um, is because we need to, the reason other cities have been successful is because they have, a, they have allowed for a level of authenticity and creative expression among artists to flourish, right? So. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know that we're going to be successful just because we've replicated this city's program or, or replicated anything. I think making strategic investments and allowing artists to do what artists do best so that this community can authentically enjoy and experience and embrace um, artworks that, that really help to define its soul is how we'll be successful with that. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And we have one hell of a community here too. You know, I, I'm a professor over at CCAD, and the work that is coming out of that program, you'll see a lot more great things coming out of the school. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love Ohio State, too, but I'm just, maybe I'm a little, <laughs> I'm a little partial. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of professional artists out there, as well as evidenced in the convention center, just producing magnificent work worth seeing. So. That's great. Our next question. Please state your name and your question. My name is David Crone. I'm with uh, Arts Co. Uh, consortium of artists. My question is, why does the bulk of support for dance in Columbus go to ballet, which is a European art form with a court aesthetic and French names for all the terms, all the steps, instead of modern dance, which is a uniquely American art form, was inventing, invented in America, developed by uh, Isidore Duncan, Hanya Holm, Martha Graham, Jose Lamon, Anna Sokolo. We just lost the tremendous modern dance company to Chicago, Christina Isabel, hijinks. She moved there because she couldn't get support here. 
So I appreciate your question. I think maybe to to wrap it in the um, in the focus of public art, it is an interesting thing we didn't talk about, which was what most of the art that we've been talking about is visual art, digital art, traditional art. What about some of those areas like dance um, that are an art form and an important art form in the city that we may not have seen necessarily represented in our public art plans, or maybe we have, and we should talk about that. I think um, I don't think I'm well qualified to answer a question about dance so specifically, but um, I think one of the big things about public art and looking to the future is this notion of stop trying to define it. Um, public art can be so many different things. It can be performance art, it can be spoken word, it can be you know, traditional sculptures, it can be sound, it can be light. So, so as we're looking at public art, stop trying to make it fit into a kind of traditional box of what we're aware of. Um, having said that, I think one of the places where the city can also really grow, um, and unfortunately it's hard to do at the city, is temporary public art. It would be really nice to see more temporary public art happening in the city. Um, it's, it's something that people can kind of, um, you know, look at and think about and not have to think about it as a, as a long commitment or maybe, you know, people will rally and say, you know, we really like this, we want it to stay. Um, you know, who knows, but the, the money that the city generally uses for public art are capital dollars. Those are projects that have to have um, a long time horizon, just like a, a streetscape project, the same sort of funds. Um, so, you know, when we're talking about partnerships, one of the great partnerships I think that can happen, um, and we've had conversations off and on with, with organizations like GCAC about this, is how can we get more support for temporary public artwork in the city, which isn't necessarily something the city can fund, but that doesn't mean it's something that can't happen and might also involve something like dance in the city and other um, more expressive um, art forms done in the public. And I, I really appreciate your asking that question. Like Lori, I don't feel qualified to speak to the ins and outs of, of local funding for dance, but um, I, I do very much just share the thought that um, we, we kind of had a conversation where we didn't all just say sculpture for a while, but we sort of all were saying sculpture for a while. No offense, Matthew. And there, there is so many different and diverse ways in which you can experience art in the built environment, in the public realm, what have you. Um, Thinking about your question and how we do a better job of celebrating the performing arts and more diverse art forms, um, we as an organization are undertaking a series of projects for next year that uh, we've received some support from the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, and a handful of others to do um, across two years to uh, um, make the built environment enjoyable during streetscape improvements. Um, so part of that will be a non-traditional approach to temporary artworks um, interwoven into construction barricades. Um, you will love them. Um, and in fact, um, we, we're doing that in partnership with um, the Columbus College of Art and Design. And I, I totally agree with what Matthew said, what these students are coming up with is um, remarkable. Um, we're also doing a, a series that will be um, performances, and we're commissioning performers to be, um, uh, and not just musicians, but dancers, spoken word artists, um, uh, uh, theatrical performers to um, uh, showcase uh, that um, segment of our arts community in, in the environment as we're experiencing that streetscape work next year as well. So um, it's a great question, and, and keep asking it. Well, I know that um, our panelists will be here. Uh, unfortunately, television waits for no woman or man. Uh, and so my script tells me uh, that I should turn the podium. Oh, no, I'm, I've been given five more minutes. The television gods have smiled on us today. Uh, so I'd ask our next, next question then to please uh, state your name and your question for the panel. Thank you. Thank you all. My name is Marijn Vanderheiden. I'm with OSU Urban Art Space. This question may be mostly for Lori, a little bit for Betsy. Um, I am so excited about the public art master plan and specifically I wanted you to talk a little bit about uh, what the goal is for this. Are you going to take stock of what's already there? What are your considerations going into this specifically from the perspective of this authentic cultural heritage? And my angle here is um, the last two years I've been involved with projects mining the Hale Black Cultural Center 
um, art collection. Right now, that's culminated in an exhibition in part at Urban Art Space. Um, we have a number of amazing Columbus artists, uh, both you know current and recently deceased, um, in the show. Uh, Andrew Scott, who turns out has a gavel just you know down the street from or, from Urban Art Space. Uh, Shirley Bowen, who was instrumental in Kwanzaa Park. Um, Smokey Brown, who a friend of mine just called me and said, gosh, there's this mural in the short north um, just by the cigar place. And I visited the other day, and it's there. You know, and it's like graffiti, kind of, but, you know, it's Smokey Brown. So the question really is, you know, are you going to take stock of those sorts of projects as well? And uh, is there a kind of a preservation or, you know, a plan to um, <coughs> preserve, in many ways, pieces like Smokies, for example, um, as part of this kind of authentic Columbus um, heritage? Thank you. Yeah. Um, hi, Marine. Um, Marine has been a, a great partner at the Urban Arts Space um, for the Public Art Program, asking uh, very tough, specific questions today. Um, <laughs> We're, we're really, we, we haven't gotten the funding yet for the public art master plan. It's a goal that I hope is a more immediate thing to do, and I, I don't, the, the Columbus Art Commission will certainly be helping to inform what that call looks like, but, um, you know, we'll also be looking for other places of input um, as to what this should include, and yes, definitely um, taking stock of what we have in the community. You know, as I mentioned before, we've been doing restoration work and we did come up with a preservation um, plan, a schedule of uh, conservation activities for art that we already have, but it goes beyond that. We have um, uh, artists and um, a diverse um, group of artists in the city that are known various other places in the country and maybe not as well known here that need to have their moment in their hometown sun. So, yeah, I think we would want to make it as broad as we possibly can and still be able to, to finish something. Um, and there may be various sections to the plan, and, and I think that that would be a very important one. That's great. I think we have time for one more question. Sir, your name and your question. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Herman. Quick question. Should we be thinking about things like uh, the Short North Arches or the Bicentennial Fountain as public art? And, and just putting our arms around and saying this is part of our public art already, and if we did, would that be helpful in some way, or does it not matter? Um, Betsy? Oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. I, sure. I saw a thought bubble. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 I would think of the arches that way, um, because they, um, they engage people in a really interesting and thoughtful way. Um, you know, was there an artist involved, though, in the design of them? Uh, I don't think so. Um, so, I, you know, I think Lori made a very interesting point earlier about the difference between um, design versus artist and, and those skills and those mindsets. Um, at the end of the day, um, the iconicism that those arches have um, is in, in many ways been very defining for Columbus. So. Um, lumping things in a pile to say there are facets of the built environment that ha that give people awe or cause them to connect. Um, uh, does that help our cause or does that advance us? I don't know, but I think it's important for us to take stock of what it is that um, creatively creates a place and foster more of all. But it, it, I think it, it, it cannot be lost the role of the artist and how critically important those artists are. Yeah, I'd like to add on to that by saying you're absolutely right and um, I think those things need to be pre preserved as part of our identity but we are thinking about the future as well. I mean I don't think we need to tear those down. I think we need to think about how we as a culture are evolving and what can we say about what's happening now or where we want to take things. That's, I think those uh, juxtapositioned uh, against each other make for a, a very interesting narrative. I guess I'd just say fountains are one of the oldest forms of public artwork and just because it's a newer piece and an unconventional form, it's still a fountain in a public space. So um, yeah, I would, I would definitely consider it a form of artwork. Um, from the Art Commission's perspective, they've kind of landed at a space where um, anything that's new, a new design that's not a catalog piece, that's not a reproduction of things that we've already done, 
um, that's something that would go to the Columbus Art Commission for um, design and placement approval. So they would see that as artwork. Thank you. I hope you all enjoyed today's forum. You can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV, Columbus Television, or WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel and anytime on CMC's website on YouTube. Let's thank our sponsors, Puffin Foundation West and Dispatch Media Group. And of course, our speakers, Betsy, Matthew, Lori, and Haley. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday.